Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come, we thank you, Lord, for this blessed time that you're given together to come together to hear your word. And I pray that you lead us and guide us into all truth, teach us to pray, to pray powerfully using your word, O oh God. I pray that this prayer session will be a great time of learning for many people. And uh, I pray that the truths of God's word will become practical realities of our lives. Thank you for those that are here, those that are wherever they are that are joining us today. Pray a blessing upon each and every one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn with me to Psalm 73. We're going to go into Psalm 73, and I told you that we have a, the book of Psalms as one book of 150 Psalms in the Old Testament, but actually, uh, among the Hebrew people, uh, they have it as five different books, book one, book two, book three, book four, and book five. And book one consists of Psalms 1 to 41, Book two is 42 to 72, which we just finished last week. And book three, we begin today with Psalm 73, and it goes on till Psalm 89. Book four is Psalm 90 to 106, and book five is 107 to 150, all right? So we are getting into book three of the books of Psalm. All right, this Psalm, I'm going to read it just a little later after I say a few things, but uh, on top there is a note, a Psalm of Asaph, it says, all right? So far, most of the Psalms that uh, we've dealt with, of the 72 Psalms that we dealt with, mostly they are uh, David's Psalms. And uh, the last verse in the last psalm, that is 72, says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So basically, this is the end of uh, David's psalms. There are a few here and there, hereafter you will see, but um, basically the psalms of David are ended. Um, and now we have other authors. And the author here is mentioned as a man named Asaph. Asaph was one of the members of the tribe of Levi who David put in charge of the worship music uh, that was performed in the tent of meeting, as it was called. Before the temple was built, there was a tent of meeting. And uh, Asaph was the man in charge of music. He was basically the music director for David's uh, temple or, or tent all right, uh, at, at Jerusalem. And uh, being the leader of music there, of the music group, he seems to have become the leader of this group and then became the father of an entire clan of temple musicians later on. Eh? And David gave some of his psalms, of his own psalms to Asaph, and these were performed by him and his associates. We read about it in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. You know, in 1 Chronicles 6, we read how, how he was installed as the music director. And 1 Chronicles 16, we read about how David himself gave some psalms to him to be performed, all right? But Asaph himself also composed psalms. One of these psalms is Psalm 50 uh, from the second book of the Psalter. The other psalms, which are said to be Asaph's psalms, are Psalms 73 to 83, which we're going to study. We're going to do Psalm 73 now. But 73 to 83 are Asaph's psalms. And uh, that is the first several psalms of the third book. Uh, of the six remaining psalms in book three, see, Psalm, the book three goes until 89, right? Psalm 89, so six remaining psalms of the book three. Four are by the sons of Korah, if you read the top note. Four are by the sons of Korah, and another 
which is 89, is by another psalmist. His name is mentioned in Psalm 89. And Psalm 86 is by Psalmist David. All right. All right. <clears throat> the psalm is about one very important thing that is happening in the life of Asaph. Asaph is having a, what you call a paradigm shift. He was thinking about everything in one way. Now he's having a very new perspective about everything, about God, about himself, about the world, about why the things are the way they are. You may want to call it like this. He was beginning to look at everything in light of eternity. And when you look at everything in light of eternity, everything looks different. If you look at everything in light of your life here and just this earthly life, you get a totally different picture. But if you look at everything in light of eternity, then it becomes a totally different thing. I think we all have to, at one time or the other, naturally we are here on this earth, we're living an earthly life, and uh, we don't know much about eternity sometimes. And so we think in terms of this earthly life, you know, the years that we spend here, that's the way we measure everything the significance that we give to everything, the importance we give to everything, is based on the fact that we are on this earth 70, 80 years, 90 years, whatever. We base everything on that. But a spiritual person must learn to have this new outlook. We need to learn to look at everything in light of eternity. It'll just transform you, it'll just change you like anything. And that is what you see happening to Asaph. He begins to see things in light of eternity. When he began to look at things in the light of his, just his earthly life, actually his spiritual life went down. There was a time in Asaph's life, his spiritual life was going down. I'll show you, this psalm is about that. You will see his spiritual life going down and then he's got a turning point where he realizes that life is not just what you have here. You need to look at everything in light of eternity. And then once he realizes that, he speaks about it in the later part of the psalm. Once he realizes that, his spiritual life really is moving forward and moving upward. All right? Now, let's look at it. It's a very interesting thing. Eh? I'm going to read it in just a couple of minutes. But... One thing that makes Asaph a very attractive person here to me is the honesty about himself and what he saw around himself. The honesty with which he speaks. A lot of us will have things in our heart but we won't speak outside because people will think something. But here is a man who openly speaks it out. When he saw or what he saw bothered him uh, so much uh, and what he saw was this that the wicked seem to do very well <laughs> the wicked people in this world in this world are successful they seem to be very prosperous they seem to be moving up in this world <laughs> everything is, seems to be going fine with them they seem to be having no problem at all they're fine uh, they're doing much better than the godly people you know, and uh, he now begins to think and gets discouraged because he thinks, well, if God is God and if he's a sovereign God and if he's a just God, how can wicked people prosper? Only godly people must prosper. This is not right. If this universe is governed by a moral God who does what is right, then how can he allow the wicked people to prosper and godly people to suffer, you know. So, moral universe directed by God should be a place where the righteous prosper and the wicked suffer, you know. That's the way it should be. Why is it exactly the opposite? The righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. This becomes a very big question. Now, this is a very big question to every Christian today. <laughs> At one time or the other, we have faced that question and uh, we have said ourselves, if God is in control of things, eh, 
the plans of the wicked should fail. Uh, they should not succeed. They should even be punished openly because these fellows are wicked, not good. Uh, the godly people should prosper. But that's not what Af Asaph saw. Uh, it's not what we see also many times in this world. We see the scoundrels getting rich, <laughs> right? We see all the wicked people that kill and destroy and do all kinds of evil things becoming very successful. Utterly degenerate persons. Uh, sometimes really do very well. They get well paid, they are very sought after, they are very famous, you know. Even the criminals you see in this world, they tell their story in a book and make millions of dollars, you know. Just like that. <laughs> they would have been the worst criminal in the world, but for his story they are giving five, ten million dollars just for his story, which is made into a movie or made into a book or something like that. Uh, so, why do the wicked prosper? and the godly have such a hard time. This is the question in Asaph's mind that he poses here in 73rd Psalm. And this is the question for which he receives answers. That's the most interesting thing about this Psalm. Yeah. And this is the same question that is raised in Psalm 37 as well. And we studied that already and we looked at it from that angle. In Psalm 37, the same question is raised. And in the book of Job, the same question is raised. Uh -huh. In each of these places, in Psalm 37 as well as in the book of Job, different answers are suggested. In Psalm 37, the answer is, wait, trust in God uh, to do the right thing. In the end, the wrong will be set right. Don't worry. In the end, everything will be taken care of. In the end you will see the righteous will be blessed and the wicked will be punished and so on, even though you don't see it. Now that's the answer that Psalm 37 uh, comes up with. Yeah? And David says in Psalm 37, for example, in verse one and two, he says, do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. So there is the answer. He says, don't fret because of the evil people prospering. Don't be envious of them who do wrong because they'll just wither and they'll soon die away and so on. In Job, on the other hand, the answer is different. In Job, after they ask all kinds of questions and express all kinds of uh, doubts and go through all philosophical uh, guessings. God gets a hold of them and some from verse, I mean chapter 38 to 41 is a very interesting chapter where God says, look, if I began to explain all of these things, you won't even understand. You haven't even understood how I created the heavens and the earth, how the heavens came about, how the earth came, have you, have you seen the creation? Huh? Do you understand how I created everything? Even if I describe it and tell you, you won't be able to understand. And you're trying to understand some complex uh, problems that you see in this world. So the answer in the book of Job is simply that God is above us and we better not, you know, question him like that. Uh, just challenge him on that. You need to... Uh, you need to understand that you are not up to the mark. You cannot understand very much of these things. So don't be upset just because you see injustice, you see the wicked prospering and all of that. You are not able to understand even the work of creation. Eh? How will you understand God's ways with the righteous and God's ways with the wicked? How will you understand these complex things? And so Job comes to a conclusion after God speaks to him from chapter 38 to 41, Job comes to a conclusion. In chapter 42, you read his answer. He says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. Uh, so that's what he was told. This is too wonderful for you to know. This is too difficult for you to understand. It's too complex. You know, it's not like I can just tell you in five minutes and you can understand, you know. These are some very difficult things. 
And you better understand that you are a man, you can only understand up to a certain point. And that is what he was told. So he says, I'll shut up, I'll not speak. You speak, and so on. In other words, he's simply saying, I'll trust you, and uh, I understand this much, that you are good, you always do right, and, and so on. I don't understand what's going on when I see, uh, you know, all kinds of injustice done to me, but I will just, I'll just leave it to you, and I will not speak, you speak, and then his life turns around completely. In Psalm 73, the answer is neither one of those answers. He is neither told that he needs to wait and trust and believe that God in the end will make everything right. Eh? Nor is he told that he cannot really know the answers. It's too complex for him to even comprehend right now. What in 73, in Psalm 73, what we have is that uh, <clears throat> the ultimate end of the wicked beyond this life, uh, it, it's, it, Psalm 73 talks about the ultimate end of the life of the wicked and uh, the end of the life of those who are righteous. Eh? In Psalm 73, it gives a very good treatment of this question. Eh? The reason uh, Asaph asks the honest question, he expresses his doubts honestly, he looks at the world with open eyes, then comes to God for the answer to his problems, and uh, then he arrives at some wonderful answers, and that's what we're gonna look at. Look at his doubts beginning in verse one. He says, surely God, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Uh, so, but then he says, but as for me, my feet has almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold. Uh, so first he says, surely God is good to Israel, to those that are pure in heart. But then he stops and says, but wait a minute, as far as I'm concerned, my feet has almost slipped. That means uh, I'd nearly lost my foothold. He talks about how, in the next verses, he's talking about how, as a matter of personal testimony, he says that I've been in doubt about this fact that God is good. The goodness of God is a wonderful truth, and, uh, but Asaph has some questions in the face of some realities that he sees in this world. If God is good, then why is this like this? If God is good, then why is this happening? That kind of question, all right? So you can see a movement in this psalm like this. Eh? Now we'll, we're gonna read Psalm 73. Eh? You can, you're gonna see in the first verse, the psalm begins with the truth of verse one, that God is good. He's good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Let's read verse two to 15. But as for me, my feet had almost uh, slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how could God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure, and I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted. Every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. You can see him descending into a spiritual uh, low. 
he's complaining about how well these wicked people are doing. They have no, they have no trouble, no worry. They've got plenty of money. They've got plenty of everything. Uh, everything is going well with them. They so seem to have no problem at all. But here he is. Eh? <laughs> he says, what about me? You know, I've, I've, I've kept my faith, eh? my heart pure, and I've washed my hands in innocence. That means I've been innocent of all these sins, but look at me, you know. That's, that's the way he's, he's really getting spiritually discouraged about the things that are happening. Look at verse 16 and 17. Yeah. The third movement in our, it, he reaches a turning point. First, he begins with the truth that God is good. Then, he descends into personal doubt and turmoil. The third thing is, here he comes to a turning point. Look at verse 16 and 17. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. Eh? So 16 and 17 are very important uh, verses. Uh, which show that there is a turning point taking place in his life. All of a sudden, something is happening. This troubled him deeply, but he does one thing. He goes to the sanctuary of God. He goes to worship. And there he is in a place of worship. And there, he begins to finally understand something about their destiny, the wicked destiny. And then look at verse 18. 18 to 28, then he again rises up spiritually. He really gets quickened spiritually with encouragement. 18 to 28, surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They're like dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I'm always with you. You hold me, by, hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward you'll take me into glory. Whom I have in heaven but you. The earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. Uh, you can see three different movements. One is he begins with a, with a great statement that God is good. Uh, he's been good to Israel. But then he has a lot of doubts. And the doubts cause him to go down. He's very disappointed at what is actually in reality happening in this world. And then he goes to the sanctuary, to the place of worship, and there, we'll talk about what happens there, you know, there he comes to the turning point, he begins to understand somehow, eh? and uh, begins to see uh, things as he ought to see them, and then thereafter, he reascends to where the psalm began that God is good again. He concludes with the fact that God is good. <laughs> Let's look at his spiritual descent going down. <laughs> step by step we'll look at it. You see, these are real genuine doubts that Asaph had. <laughs> he knows that God is good. He has experienced his goodness. But He's got some personal doubts. God is good, he's pure, he's, he's everything that is good. But Asaph confesses his own lack of goodness. And uh, he now confesses to the fact that his heart has been uh, filled with some impure thoughts. Uh, and he confesses the fact that his feet has almost slipped. That means he has descended to a low in spiritual life because 
he knows that god is good on the one hand on the other hand he sees a different reality in the world where the wicked prosper and the righteous are not doing well he says how come he's got thousand questions eh? and there you have from verse 2 to 15 the descent is described the problem is this the problem that asaph has with this the psalmist has a problem and the problem is that he is envying the wicked <laughs> look at verse 2 and 3 but as for me my feet had almost slipped i had nearly lost my foothold for i envied the arrogant when i saw the prosperity of the wicked <laughs> When he observed the prosperity of the wicked, his expectations were crushed. He couldn't believe that in a moral universe, with a moral God governing the universe, that righteous people, good people, sometimes suffer so much, and wicked people goes, go unpunished, and they prosper. And more than that, his problem is now he is beginning to envy the uh, wicked people. And by envying, he has almost slipped, he says. That means he has almost fallen back down. In spiritual life, have you ever experienced that kind of a thing? Something happens in your life, you have thousand questions. You come across so many questions, you cannot answer, you don't find answers. It seems very complex. And you begin to ask questions, if God is righteous, then why this is so? God is good, then why this is happening? That kind of a thing. And then you go on and on and on, and then you find yourself spiritually descending into a very low level, so that your faith in God is affected. His problem was that he looks at the wicked people, their health, their wealth, and their prosperity, and compares it with his lack of prosperity and he is resentful that God would allow such a thing to happen and allow such a thing to continue. He says, why is God not treating us the way that he should? The other people are doing better, but we have to struggle for a living while they coast along without any trouble. The problem is envy. Envy is criticizing God. And criticizing God is not good because it's not going to do you any good. There are many things in this life we don't understand, but I think Psalm 37 is good where it says, wait, trust in God. That's part of the answer to the questions that we have. And uh, we will understand sometimes much later what it's all about you can't expect to understand everything, but this guy is descending into something uh, of a spiritual low. Now let's read from verse 4 to 11. He goes into a description of the wicked. Look at that. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy. Psalm 73 verse 4. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy. I'm reading from NIV. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Yeah. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their imagination, evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. And their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High God know anything? <laughs> In other words, the wicked seem to get away with their wickedness and even boast about it, he says. They're even boasting about, look at me, I'm doing fine. You know, in history there is a story about a man named Dionysus the Younger, the ancient tyrant of Sicily. They say that he plundered the temple of Syracuse, a place of worship, and sailed home safely with his loot. And then he remarked the same saying, do you not see how the gods favor those who commit sacrilege? 
Don't you see how God blesses those people that so disrespect him and commit sacrilege, literally, literally treat the sacred things as filthy things. That's what sacrilege is all about. Sometimes you think such persons must be immediately punished, then they will understand something, the world will see something. Some, have you ever felt like that? Sometimes when you see tremendous evil practiced by some people, you wonder why God has not sent fire down from heaven and burned them up or something like that. Some big punishment just come down immediately. That'll teach them a lesson, we think, and nothing happens. <laughs> Seems like God is being insulted and he doesn't do anything. Yeah? And the people take pride in that. See, I did this to God, what did he do to me? Yeah? Where is that God? They take pride in that. Yeah? They clothe themselves with violence. Pride is their necklace. Look at their words. Yeah? Their imaginations have no limit. They scoff and speak with malice. Yeah? Their mouths lay claim to heaven. Their tongues take possession of the earth. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? Look at the words coming out of their mouth. And then he summarizes it all in verse 12. That is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. This is what they're like, and they go on always carefree. They increase in wealth. Yeah. He's very envious about the lifestyle of the rich and famous. <laughs> he says, look at us, God's children. We don't have much, but these people are just floating on money, have everything they want and have it much more than they need. Yeah. And in fact, in the next few verses, he talks about how he's being punished for being good. He says, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and I've washed my hands in innocence. I've been so pure, I've been innocent, he says. All day long I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. <laughs> yeah. He's comparing himself with others. But look at verse 15, very interesting. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. <laughs> what does that mean? Even at this low point where he's complaining about how wicked are doing well and he's not doing so well, uh, even at that point where he's oppressed by what he sees and jealous of those for whom he would have no, uh, he should have no envy. Asaph is still a believing child of God, it looks like. One way he shows it is by what he does next. You know what he does? He says, although he felt this way, he didn't want to say it out, he says. I didn't want to say it like that, he says. Because he didn't want to harm the faith of the other people. Other people meaning those he calls the children of God or your children. He says, I'm feeling like this. I'm feeling like speaking out my feelings. But I don't want to speak it out because there are other children of God. They should not get discouraged. <laughs> that shows that, in a way, he's a man of God, <laughs> even though he's in the moment of discouragement and feels bad and has honest, genuine doubts. He's still completely not departed from the faith. He's got doubts. But he's a man of God. He cares about the reputation of God that he should not speak in such a way to discourage other believers. Eh? It's an interesting point. Now, the turning point comes. Look at verse 16 to 17. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. So he came to a very low point almost speaking out his feelings against God. But then he realizes that'll hurt believers, other believers, their faith. So he keeps quiet. But then finally, he entered the sanctuary of God. 
entered the sanctuary of God. There he came to understand the final, final destiny of the wicked, he says. Now what is the connection between this new perception, new knowledge that he is now getting and entering into the sanctuary of God? What happened when he entered into the sanctuary of God? What happened? What might have happened? It doesn't say it. It simply says that he entered into the sanctuary and there he got a new perspective. He began to understand their final destiny, the wicked people and their final destiny. His question is, how can wicked prosper and righteous suffer? He says, I went into the sanctuary, into the place of worship, I began to get answers. What might have happened? John Calvin, a great Bible teacher, back in the 16th century, he said, he thought that entering the sanctuary meant studying the word of God that was kept there, the law of God that was kept there. Uh, that is entering into studying the things about God, the revelation concerning God. Uh, oftentimes that was taught there. Another teacher suggested that Asaph saw the altar upon which a fire was always burning where the offerings for sin was consumed. When he entered into the sanctuary, the sanctuary in those days had Places, place where they brought the sacrifices and killed the animal and then burnt them into burnt offerings and constantly they were making offerings. So there's always fire burning, burning the animal down to ashes as burnt offering. And when he saw that, the teachers, the, this teacher, this other teacher says, when he saw the offerings being killed, the animal being killed and burned and so on, uh, he began to see something about redemption, something about our sins being punished uh, in that animal and so on. And the end result of sin, he realized there, is death. When the animal died, it didn't die simply. It was dying for our sins. So everybody that lives in sin, lives in wickedness, is going to face death one day. And he's reminded of the fact that even though the wicked prosper, their end result will be death. Yeah. And the fire represented the judgment of God. The fire that was burning represented the judgment of God. So when he saw the death of the animal in the altar and the fire which burned, he, the, he saw that the end result of sin is death. And after death, there is going to be judgment that's going to come. And so he began to now look at things differently. But I think there is even a better way to explain it. There is even a better way. Those two things are all right. He went in the sanctuary, in the sanctuary, the word of God, the law of God is kept there. Maybe he read it, it was taught, somebody spoke it. And then he saw the sacrifice being killed, burned, all that meant something, showed him the end of sin, the result of sin, the judgment, death and judgment and all of that. Then he felt consoled that he's not going to, that is not going to be his end, you know. All that is fine. But you can say it even better in this way, I think. When he went into the sanctuary, Asaph came to see everything from God's perspective rather than from his own limited and sinful worldview. He began to see things differently when he went into the sanctuary. He began to see the lives of the wicked and also his own life from the perspective of eternity. He experienced a paradigm shift, if you want to call it that way. There's another preacher who says this, he says, worship puts God at the center of our vision. He's in a place of worship, worshiping God. He says, worship puts God at the center of our vision. It is vitally important because it is only when God is at the center of our vision that we sing, see things as they really are. When he came to the worship, he was focused on God. God is the center when we come to worship. And that is when he begins to have a proper perspective of life. 
So you begin to see everything in light of eternity. Oftentimes we see everything in light of our life on this earth. Maybe 100 years here on this earth, if you live maximum, you're going to live up to that. Everybody looks at life within the bare limits of those 100 years and what happens here. And, and all significance is given to this 100 years of life here on this earth. But when you come to a place of worship, you're encountering God, you're thinking about God, the preaching of God, God's word goes on, the reading of God's word goes on, your attention is turned to God. That is why it's nice to come to prayer, it's nice to come to service, because, you know, it's nice to set aside a whole day in a week to do all of these things, because many times you get so busy with life, and if you go on like that, you'll only look at things from an earthly perspective. You will never have this perspective of eternity. You will never look at things in light of eternity. Once he began to look at things in light of eternity, he begins to understand that life is not just what you live here, even longer than what you live here, and so much longer is the life in eternity that you're gonna spend with God. Now, he, what did he understand? Listen to this. Surely you place them on slippery grounds, verse 18. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. He was jealous of them. He was envying them. Now he sees their real plight. They are on slippery ground, he says. He's feeling sorry for them all of a sudden. He was envying them. Now he feels sorry for them. They are suddenly destroyed completely swept by terror. They're like a dream when one awakes, when you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, see, when his heart was grieved, a while ago he was very grieved in his heart because of the wicked prospering. He says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. Completely different now, he says. I was senseless and ignorant. And notice the next line. I was a brute beast before you. He says, Lord, forgive me because just a while ago I was complaining about how they are getting rich and how they are having no problems. Everything is going fine with them. What a senseless, ignorant person I've been, I realize. Coming into the church does something to you, doesn't it? Yeah? It makes you think completely differently. Coming in encounter with the word of God. Even at home when you read the word of God and give time to the meditation of God's word, when it comes and enlightens you, something happens. You get into a spiritual high. You may be discouraged and going down, but all of a sudden you feel that you are lifted up and taken to a higher level spiritually of faith and everything. You may have been deeply disappointed by life's circumstances, but all of a sudden, the word of God, the teaching of God's word, prayer, and all of these things, when God comes in the center, when you enter into a place of worship or when you enter into worship and God is the center, things change. You become, begin to have a different perspective. <laughs> That's the significance of coming into this church or a place where the word of God is taught. It does something to you. Something will happen. Your heart will change. The man realizes, I've been senseless and ignorant. I've been like an animal. <laughs> Just like an animal. Just, I'm supposed to think deeply. I'm supposed to think about God, know God. I'm supposed to have a relation. I'm not just an animal that's looking at another animal eating a big cow or something like that and wanting to fight with it for the food. No, I'm not an animal. I'm a man, I believe in God. God supplies all my needs. God is more than enough for me. I trust in God, he's my God, he's my heavenly father. I don't have to worry about what to eat and what to drink and what to be clothed with. My God is a good God. He watches over me. I can trust him in even in bad circumstances because in the end it's going to be good. Let's pray for a while. Just a little bit of prayer at this time I think is very important. 
Just open your heart and say, Lord, speak to me today. Let your word make a big change in my heart, O oh God. I can't bring my discouragements, my doubts, my questions, my anguish, and everything that I'm going through. Be honest before God. God knows your heart. Tell God that you have come to him with all of that and ask him to help. You've come in the presence of God. We've come in prayer. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We open our hearts today as we look into your word. I pray that you'll minister to people that are here as well as so many that join us from everywhere today for this service, oh God. No matter what they're going through, what great discouragement and disappointment they're going through. The thousand questions that are bombarding their minds. Uh, the anguish of their hearts. Their heart is saying, where is God? Why is God doing like this? Does God know what is happening in my life? Such questions are there in so many people's hearts. Plagued with questions. Experiencing a spiritual low, we come to you, O oh God. And I pray as people come to you today, the Spirit of God will help open the Word of God to them. Minister to them, O oh God. Speak to their hearts today. Enlighten them. Just like Asaph went into the sanctuary and he was transformed. He got a turning point there. Because that is where his going down stopped and he started rising with faith. And I pray that same experience will be ours today, O oh God. May this time be a time of encouragement. Encouragement, no matter what we are discouraged of. Let this time be a time of encouragement. The Spirit of God, through the Word of God, minister to people. Let our fears and worries be addressed at this time. Let God be our focus, O oh God. Help us to take our eyes off of the world and the things of this world and put it on you and your things, O oh God. Oh, help us to see everything in light of eternity. Help us to see the big picture rather than this narrow outlook and perspective of life. Help us to think the way that you think and help us to understand your magnificence, your greatness, your goodness, your power. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We pray for our people today, wherever they are, that they'll be ministered to today, that this will be a time of encouragement for them. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. May my mind's eyes be opened. Let the Spirit of God enlighten people today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, look at Asaph, the psalm writer. <laughs> he went into a sanctuary, he says, then I began to understand something. <laughs> I pray that God will help you to understand, even those that are watching from homes and wherever you are, whichever country you're from. I'm praying that God will open your understanding today. Whatever your problem is, that God will speak to your heart and quicken you today. What did he understand? Listen to this. <laughs> After he says, I was a brute beast, I'm like an animal, I've, I've, I've descended so low, I could not even think. I was like an animal that doesn't think much. <laughs> so low I've descended. And now we look at verse 23. Verse 23 to 26 is something I think everybody should memorize. <laughs> I think we should say it almost every day. It should become very dear to our heart. It's part of many, many hymns and songs, even some choruses that we sing here in our church, worship songs. Look at this. This is what he learned. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. Ah, something has happened to him. He says, God, I'm always with you. You're holding me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. <laughs> he realizes all of a sudden, my God, God is with me. And I'm with God. God is holding me by my right hand. He's giving me counsel. He's leading me. He's guiding me. That is true prosperity. That is more prosperity than 
any prosperity in this world. That's more than what the richest man in this world has got. You've got God by your side. He's taking you by the hand. He's leading you. He's giving you counsel and the wisdom and the understanding to deal with your problems of your life. You're having something that a lot of rich people don't have. You're richer than them, I would say. You're richer than the richest man on earth. If you got God by your side and God is taking you by the hand, if God is giving you counsel, I would say, I'm not poor. I'm very, very rich because I'm rich with true prosperity. That is true prosperity. Knowing God is true prosperity. What words? You guide me with your counsel all through my earthly life, then you, afterward you will take me into glory. Wow. <laughs> Have you seen some godly people die? I've seen. Godly people die with great peace. They know that they're going from here to a better place, to a better position, to a better life. I've seen even people longing to go, like Paul, he says, I think it's better for me to go. For me, it's better to go. I can't wait to go, he says. But for you, it's better for me, for, for you that I stay here. I don't know which one to do, to stay here or to go, he says. He can't decide. That's a good problem. I don't know if I want to stay or I want to go, he says, because I'd rather go because I can be with him. <laughs> what a perspective on life. And look at this, whom have I in heaven but you? In heaven, what is so special about heaven? My God, uh, whom I have in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. In earth, what is the greatest thing that I have? There is nothing else I desire on earth other than you, he says. Completely changed. <laughs> he was envying the rich man all this time. <laughs> he was jealous of the rich. <laughs> that was hurting him. Comparing his wealth with their wealth. <laughs> Comparing how they live with how he lives and all that. And all of a sudden he begins to see that he lives far better. He's in the mighty hands of God. God is holding him by his hand, leading him, guiding him. And he will take him from this world into eternity one day. And in heaven, he's going to live with God. And in earth, as long as he lives in earth, there is nothing else I desire more than you, he says. And then he says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Wow. Even if my heart and my strength fails, you are my portion forever. <laughs> then he says, those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. That's their end. What do I have to be envious of? <laughs> I don't have nothing to be envious of those people. I have to pity them. I have to pray for them. They need to know God. They're not truly prosperous. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. No more complaining. <laughs> He's completely changed, transformed by going into the sanctuary. <laughs> How many say, thank God for a church? <laughs> Thank God you can come and hear the word. Thank God you can receive encouragement. Thank God you can be awakened to the truth that you normally don't see. You're living with a worldly perspective and coming to church, hearing the word of God, being in the presence of God, bring, being where God is the focus in worship, reading the word, meditating on the word, praying, completely changes us. You can experience that even in your home every day as you spend time with the Word and pray. I tell you, especially in, in times of great discouragement, fear, worries, this is the greatest medicine. 
You know, some people go crazy, literally. Their minds are, I've seen people just lose their mind with worries and problems. Go crazy with worldly problems, just problems that with God's help can be solved in no time. You know, they just can't see that they're walking with God, that they're with God. They can't see that God is holding, by the, holding them by their hand. They're not able to see that God is able to give them guidance. They're not able to see, so worried. <laughs> They're on drugs, <laughs> one drug, af- drug after the other to calm themselves down. <laughs> Sedate them because the worry is getting the better of them. And I tell you, here is a medicine that is matchless. Amazing, amazing medicine. Put your trust in God, my friend. Get an eternal perspective of your life. Don't live only with an earthly perspective. Don't be just worried about these earthly things. It's not, this earthly life is not everything. There's much more than that. There is God. There is godly wisdom. There is God's power. That will help you even in this earth throughout your life. Shall we pray? I want you to use the verses from verse 23 to 26 to pray. And when you go home today, every day, you use these verses and pray, and you see what it does to you. Use those very verses and say it in your own way, with your words, but say the very same thing that it says. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I thank you. Thank you, Lord because I'm always with you. I'm always with you and you are always with me, oh God. You never leave me nor forsake me. I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You are guiding me. You are leading me into the destiny that you have for me, oh God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You hold me by my right hand. Thank you for you guide me. You give me the counsel. You give me the ideas. You give me a vision. You give me my desires. You give me the way I should accomplish them. You give me every resource I need. You are my wisdom. You are my knowledge. You are my understanding. You are my power. Oh, you are my enabler. You are everything. Without you, I can do nothing. But with you, I can do all things. I thank you, Father. Thank you, because with you, I can do all things. And I'm with you always. I'm always with you, even in bad situations, in bad circumstances, in challenging situations. I am with you, Lord, and you are guiding me. Your guidance is there, and as long as your guidance is there, I will win. I will win every battle of this life. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for throughout my earthly life, you'll guide me, take me by the hand, lead me into all that you have for me. And one day, Afterwards, you will take me into glory. Oh, thank you, Father. Nothing to fear of getting old. Nothing to fear of the coming years. Nothing to fear about what next after death. Nothing to fear because you will take me into glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for you will take me into glory. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Glory is the destination that you have for me. Thank you, Father. Glory is the destination, not shame. Not shame, glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Who have I in heaven but you, Lord? Oh, the earth has nothing I desire beside you. Oh, in heaven and on earth, the only thing I desire is you, Lord. You are there. When you are there, everything is there. Oh, because seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. Thank you. Thank you for true riches, true prosperity. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the overflowing prosperity of knowing God, having the knowledge of God, having the presence of God, having the power of God, having the guidance of God. That is more than any prosperity of this world. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my heart and my flesh may fail, but Lord, you are the strength of my heart and my portion 
forever. Thank you, Jesus. You are my strength. Even physically, you are my strength. You are my strength forever. You are my strength, O oh God. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you that I do not have to look at anybody and be jealous of anything. I do not have to look at the wicked and be jealous or be afraid or be impressed or be even intimidated by anything that they have or they can do. Oh, because their end is sad. Their end is sad because they don't know you. They don't have you. They don't have the guidance of God. They don't have the guidance of God. Oh God, what a privilege it is to live for you. Oh, it is good to be near you, O oh Lord. As for me, it is good to me to be near you. I've made you my refuge, O oh God. All my life, every day that I live on this earth, I will declare your deeds. I will preach your word. I will tell people of your glory and of your goodness. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, he ends it exactly the opposite way. In the, in the first, in the beginning, he said, but as for me, my feet has almost slipped. <laughs> That's how he started his descent, right? As for me, my feet has almost slipped. But look at verse 28, he says, but as for me, again he says, but as for now, complete different perspective. As for me, it's good to be near God. <laughs> Everybody say, as for me, it's good to be near God. God is my refuge. I will declare his deeds forever. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. You can meditate on this yeah. until verse 12. Verse 1 to verse 12, the emphasis is upon the pronoun they. He's talking about they, who? The wicked and how they prosper and all that. Then verse 13 to 17, the dominant pronoun is I. He's talking about me, 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 I. Uh, he's talking about himself, uh, 13 to 17. And then verse 18 to 22, he talks about God. He says, you, you, you. And then verse 23 to 28, he talks about God and him. I'm with you. You are with me. <laughs> you guide me. You take me by the hand and all that. You know, what a wonderful thing. Just think about it. Meditate on it as you pray. And realize that what is happening here. You can turn your spiritual lows into spiritual highs. If you just meditate on this psalm and go through this and realize what is happening here. And go through the same transformation that he is going through here. Wonderful to be the sanctuary. How many of you are glad you are here today? You came here today. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today. Thank you for this time of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for working in our hearts, touching our hearts with your word today. Many of us needed it. Many of us needed this hour today. And many that are hearing us from everywhere be blessed today because of what has happened to them right now at this moment. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.